Welcome to The Great Awakening. I'm your host, Josh Dawes. Earlier this week, I had the opportunity to sit down with Dr. Yoram Hazoni to discuss his latest book, which is called Conservatism, A Rediscovery. In that book, uh, which I just finished last week, um, Dr. Hazoni talks about kind of the philosophy of conservatism and how the modern uh, conservative movement has kind of um, drifted away from those uh, historic uh, conservative values. And uh, it, it's a really uh, fascinating book. It's helpful. It's part history, part philosophy, part practical. Um, we, in the conversation, we talk about that. He explains uh, kind of the point of the book, what he's trying to accomplish. And we touch on a, a range of things from uh, Christian nationalism to how to live a conservative life and, and where the modern conservative movement has gone wrong. And it's a, it's a great conversation. I think you're really going to enjoy it. So uh, without further ado, let's just jump right into that conversation. Thanks for coming on the show, Dr. Hazoni. Sure, my pleasure. Um, so you recently wrote um, a book that just came out. I finished it last week called Conservatism, A Rediscovery. And in that, you really... Um, you capture a lot of the frustrations a lot of us have had on the right with with conservatism, you know, a conservatism that, frankly, a lot of times doesn't seem to be conserving much. Um, and you level some critics, you know, critiques at modern conservatism. What is wrong with modern conservatism? Well, I think you've already touched it. Uh, if it's not uh, if, if it's not about conserving and transmitting national and religious traditions from one generation to the next then it's not conservatism. And uh, th there's an awful lot of people expressing opinions on the subject, but usually when you hear people who call themselves conservatives talk, address the question of, you know, what is it we're conserving? Uh, they start talking to you about freedom. And uh, the problem with freedom is that, although it's a precious thing and important for all of us, you know, something that we'd be very, very sorry to lose, um, freedom doesn't conserve anything. And so when you start talking about, when you're talking to somebody who calls themselves a conservative, and the first thing they start talking to you about is individual liberties, uh, you know you're talking to a liberal, not a conservative. If they start talking to you about what we need to do in order for a life of conservation and transmission to take place, in order for our uh, religious beliefs and uh, the, the strength of our nation to uh, carry on for several generations, then you know you're talking to an act actual conservative. Okay, and uh, so what is, you know, I grew up in the 80s. Individual liberties, you know, it felt like like one of the, you know, pillars of conservatism. You know, you, you're pro-life, you're for individual liberty, you like smaller government. That, that's conservatism. But that's, that we're, I, th I think you're absolutely right that we're finding that that is not actually conserving anything. So what is it that we need to rediscover? Well, look, the, the, the book has, has different parts. Uh, you, you read it so that you know that there's a historical part which, which uh, goes back uh, a number of centuries before Burke <clears throat> in, or, in, in order to try to understand what the, the Anglo-American conservative tradition was. And then there's a philosophical part, which, uh, w which deals with human nature and asks, uh, what, what are human beings like? What, what, what's, what's the role of uh, inheritance versus freedom in, uh, in societies that are, are stable and are able to conserve things? And uh, I think we need to think differently about, uh, about both of them. I mean, uh, th th there's a lot to say about it, but let's take, take as an example uh, the, the um, uh, I, I start in the book with uh, with the commandment to uh, to honor your father and your mother, and uh, of course, scripture is very terse and it doesn't explain to you why you should be honoring your father and your mother. But I think that if we uh, if if we take a look at traditional societies, we find that what happens is that small children who are uh, who are taught to uh, honor their parents as a lifelong obligation from from the time that they're very little, they're actually capable of uh, of learning things from their parents. There's a uh, you know an, a, a natural change that comes over children when they when they reach adolescence. Um, they you know they they become larger in body, they become larger in spirit, and uh, and there's a danger that they begin to have resent resentment and contempt for their parents rather than continuing to honor them. 
And uh, in in liberal society, uh, which is you know based on theories of you know th uh, uh, enlightenment rationalist theories like those of of Locke and and Rousseau, where you know the child is supposed to be fully formed by the time that he or she is eighteen or twenty years old, and at that point to become the equal of their parents and to owe their parents nothing. Uh, if you're raised in that kind of society, uh, then essentially what you're doing is 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 raising a, a, a crop of revolutionaries every generation of contempt for their parents and inability to uh, to learn from their parents. Um, when I when I say parents, of course, the parents just stand in for the the larger society. If you can't learn from your parents, then you probably also can't learn from from your church, from your your commanding you know officer in the military. Uh, from uh, from 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 any kind of uh, unchosen superior, and uh, th that's essentially what we've created. Uh, we, in you know, in, uh, after World War II, America and Europe set out on this course, saying you know that they were going to solve all the all the historical wrongs that had had, had ever been committed. Some of them were were, were truly wrongs, but uh, the the scheme that they came up with for solving all the wrongs in the world is to teach children uh, that. Uh, that it's just a few more years until uh, until you leave your parents and and don't owe them anything anymore, um, and that that kind of anti hierarchical revolutionary society is is in one in, one in which transmission becomes almost impossible. So you know maybe the few first few years it looked okay, but now we're you know we're we're two two generations into this experiment, and and people literally cannot. You know, are having trouble distinguishing between a man and a woman, and it, it, it we're we're very quickly learning how much of what it was that we used to believe uh, was inherited, were things that were handed down, and yeah. uh, uh, and and there's no in, end in sight. Yeah, in the book you point out that a lot of these Enlightenment thinker thinkers were single, childless men that you know, didn't really have that context of family. I thought that was a, that was a really powerful insight and, and reading that section on uh, res the kind of duty we have to our family uh, kind of hit me pretty profoundly because when um, my wife and I had our first son, um, when he was uh, a year old, we packed up and moved across the country to California to pursue a career out there. And looking back, um, you know, we were there for about eight years and moved, you know, started feeling that pull to come back to family, um, came back and, you know, my mom, um, unexpectedly died a couple of years ago and, and I wouldn't trade anything for the year we had, but then I look at like the eight years that we spent apart from them and just the duty. Um, I, I just was really convicted reading that, that man, we took a precious inheritance from my mom, you know, that time with her grandkids in pursuit of, you know, the American dream. And, and can you talk a bit more about that, that duty we have to family that we're born into, you know, we're not just free autonomous creatures where we have responsibilities. Right. So if, if you look at, if you break liberalism and when I say liberalism, I, I mean all the different kinds of liberalism, you know, the 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 more sort of progressive liberalism, as well as the uh, the kind of classical liberalism. What they all have in common is that they uh, begin with this assert assertion that human beings are by nature uh, free and equal. And uh, you you know it, it 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 sounds nice and it's definitely well intentioned, but you know if you, if you raise children and you raise grandchildren and you you live in an actual community where that's going all along. Uh, going on all the time all around you, it, it's very, very diff difficult to understand what it could possibly actually mean. Because, it, you know, if it if it means that, you know, we, we, we shouldn't uh, unjustifiably persecute people who, you know, have uh, a different color skin or, or, or uh, are wealthy instead of poor or, or, or the opposite, you know, all of that, all of that's already, uh, that, that makes perfect sense. But as soon as you start doing this enlightenment stuff where, where people are by nature inherently free and they're perfectly equal in their freedom. As soon as you start talking like that, then I think I think that you, um, well, first of all, as soon as you start talking like that, you move to sort of the second premise of enlightenment rationalist political thought, which is which is that since we're all equal, uh, we don't we can take obligations upon ourselves 
as much as we like or as much as we don't, because consent is the basis of obligation. Th those, two, those two principles go together uh, in, in, in this kind of thinking. And uh, the, the problem with consent, obviously, is, is that none of us consent uh, to be born into the families we're born into or the nations that we're born into. And uh, some people do when they get older, they, you know, they switch religions or they switch countries. But, but the, 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 the society that we're born into and the obligations that we inherit uh, are not chosen. I mean, they're, they're simply not chosen. You know, you, you, you're, you're born into a, a family. And uh, according to, you know, biblical religion, to traditional Christianity or Judaism, your obligation to your parents is a lifelong obligation. And I, I understand why the Enlightenment uh, rationalists wanted to cut it off at 18 or 20, but the, our, our tradition is, is, is very different. Our tradition is that the obligation is a lifelong obligation. And so, for, for example, that, that means, I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that every single person can grow, uh, uh, raise their children in proximity to their parents, but, uh, but there is such an obligation. I think very few people understand uh, how much the grand parents actually are needed for educating the children because you know when you're in your when you're in your 20s and 30s and you're having your first children um, you become extremely dependent on your, on your parents they know how to raise children and you don't and 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 it goes the opposite direction as well I mean you you, you already suggested this that that um, that most grandparents uh, the 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 joy that they get the pleasure that they get and the the, the feeling of accomplishment and fruition that they get in helping raise their grandchildren and even their great grandchildren is something I, I think that's almost never talked about. I mean, there's occasionally in the media, you see some kind of somebody, you know, in a newspaper writes a column about, I discovered that, you know, my, you know, that my mother can babysit my children. Maybe that there's something good about that. But I, I think it completely underestimates the point, which is that, that when there, when there is a, an inheritance, a chain of transmission, that's taking place. First of all, you don't stop learning from your parents when you're 18. I have children who are in, in their 30s, and I think if you interview them, they'll they'll tell you that they're still learning from their parents because what happens is that as they get older, they reach new stages of life and they need to learn new things. That and and, and your parents are still ahead of you. Now, the the there is such a th there there is such a thing as this uh, sort of natural transmission through the generations, which uh, if, if you look at the nuclear family, which, you know, assumes, you know, the, the image that we have is father and mother and two or three children, then it assumes that there's, that there's no grandparents in the picture. It assumes that there's no aunts and uncles in the picture. It leaves out the congregation as basically an extended an extended family for all those times of crisis when you know when children can't learn from their parents and they need somebody else you know th then there's the members of the congregation there's the, there's the the rabbi or the minister all of these elements of a traditional uh, family are are you know simply don't exist in the enlightenment image which which you know, in the 1950s, got you know became was declared to be like the 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 nuclear family, the conservative model of the family, mm -hmm. and in fact, it's extremely destructive. I, I I mean, one of the things I I find most striking about you know reading reading Betty Friedan and and other feminists now is is how accurately they they portray the uh, detached suburban home and the nuclear family where the, the there's no longer any kind of business in the home that you know mm -hmm. that that the parents and the children and the grandparents are all involved in this. so so they have no common pursuits and what happens is that you know the father is supposed to leave and spend all of his productive hours away from home away from his his, his wife and children and then the children are shipped out to 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 live in a society of their their peers you know basically without you know w w without real adult uh, influence, not the kind of influence that you get when you're helping your parents run a business or something. Yeah. And then and then the mother is left alone at home to be a homemaker. And she's supposed to make a homemaker with an empty home. And and the feminists, I I, I regret to say it. I mean, they they basically got this right that that once the mother is alone at home, you know, with, with uh, without without 
without connection to congregation and to her parents and to the to her brothers and sisters and to the rest of the community. She's alone with those the, those machines and she's supposed to make a home. I mean, she's basically asked to do something that's completely impossible to to create uh, bonds of tight unity, loyalty, and love uh, with absent people who, who just come home in order to sleep at night. Mm-hmm. So, it, it, in a lot of ways, it's a you know we've we've really created a a, a catastrophic uh, revolutionary version of the family, um, and and the results. I mean, you can see it in 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 Jordan Peterson's a description of young men or in Abigail Schreier's description of young women um, who who are are crushed and directionless because you know because they won't weren't raised in in a, in a natural hierarchical family yeah that's um yeah that i um that makes me think of um there's there's a movement um that gives me hope um within some circles of the evangelical protestant world uh, that's really focused on productive households of bringing, you know, the the attention, the you know, making our homes productive, and kind of um, rebelling against that. Kind of the dad goes off, and I think the the remote work, um, you know, revolution that kind of was everyone was thrust into with COVID is an actual really positive development. As as dads, you know, are back in the home, that moms are back in the home you know, the homeschooling's exploding. So that that's one thing that gives me me hope, um, you know, as maybe an antidote to some of this madness. Um, I, I had that experience. I mean, look, I, I know that the, the, the stay at home, uh, stay at home school, stay at home work, stay at home religion was extremely difficult for a lot of people because, uh, you know, because our, our, our physical spaces are, are, are not are not built for this and and we're not used to it. But um, but I I've talked to many many people who said that that uh, the COVID years the lockdowns were this tremendous step forward for for their families because uh, children were were on the other side of the country moved back into the houses and as you say uh, parents started finding a way to, to 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 work at home and all of a sudden you you got a glimpse of you know of the power of the uh, uh, of the pre-modern family, of the of the traditional family, you know how strong it is, how how much learning takes place there, how how, how much um, you know real common activity and 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 work and love is possible when when you're when you're not scattered to the winds all the time. We 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 our house our house is reasonably big. We had we had a uh, we had children move home. Um, and and we uh, and and we we did we homeschooled and we we uh, uh, we did prayer services family prayer services we even had a bar mitzvah you know which is the Jewish uh, co- you know uh, coming of come of coming, coming of age ritual which is a, a a ceremony with the Torah scroll and 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 the children learn to read from the Torah we had so we have two twins who who were uh, bar mitzvah during COVID which means that. Uh, instead of going out to uh, to uh, to to a synagogue, our house was the synagogue. Our family members uh, made the bar mitzvah for the children, and I think it was just the most moving, powerful bar mitzvah that we've ever had for children. It, it was it was it it was just. I mean, you 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 can't describe the power that the family has. Uh, when it works together to do things that you thought that you never could do. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I do I do want to get to um, the last chapter of your book, but uh, I want to cover a little more ground before we get there. Um, you know, what are the ideas of Enlightenment liberalism that we need to kind of disentangle from modern conservatism? Uh, en- Enlightenment liberalism is based on uh, roughly three ideas. One, uh, we've talked about two of them already. One is that uh, that every individual is born free and born equal to all other individuals. The the second is that moral moral obligation and political obligation arise through consent. Uh, and uh, the 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 third is a is a is an, a, a view of reason which claims that uh, that that every human being is endowed with. Uh, with a capacity to reason, and that the reason, and that reasoning is the same in every culture and in every time and place. 
So the, uh, the, the point of it is that if everybody's reasoning, that reasoning seriously, then we'll all come because we have the same capacity. So, so we'll all come to the same conclusions, for example, about all human beings being free and equal by nature and, uh, and, and obligation arising through consent. And uh, I think none of those three things is, is true. But the third one is, you know, it, it, I think is, is just by far the most outrageous. I mean, all you need to do is, is uh, look, look around you at our society. But where do you see you know, uh, uh, all thinking people c c converging on a single view about philosophy, morals, politics, or religion anywhere. I mean, you know, so some people respond and they say, well, you know, the Marxists and the white identitarians, you know, and all these these strange groups that are popping up, they're not actually reasoning properly. And I, 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 th I think that's just completely false. I mean, I think that if, if you sit and talk to um, I'm not talking about the stupider Marxists. I'm talking about the, intel the, the really intelligent Marxists. People have really put a lot of thought into this, and the the the, the claim that they're you know that they don't know how to exercise reason. I mean, it, it look it's preposterous it, and and uh, and and contemptible. And the the truth is that human beings um, that reason just doesn't bring us to converge on on anything. And the the whole point of this. Um, Enlightenment rationalists claim that, re, re, that if we all reason, then we'll all converge on the same way of life and the same morals and the same way of thinking. The whole point of this was to say that there's no need for tradition. There's no, the, the, there's no need for inherited religion. There's no need for inherited constitutional frameworks. And, 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 and so, you, I mean, you literally get uh, Enlightenment rationalists saying things like, um, you know, the, 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 there's no need for a traditional constitution because every generation is a foreign country uh, to to the previous generation. There, there's no connection at all. We don't inherit anything of value uh, from 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 our parents and grandparents or from from the tradition handed down in our uh, church or synagogue. And, and I mean, people don't don't recognize that that is a cornerstone of lib, uh, of, of uh, Enlightenment liberalism. Is that belief that that you don't need the inheritance? And I. I think just look around us, you can see that, I mean, pe people just exercising reason free from any tradition, they they can justify, they come up with every possible crazy, foolish, poisonous thing. And and then they justify it. I mean, just listen to them, listen to them, you, you know, justifying giving hor hormone treatments to, uh, to, to 14 year olds and, and worse. They're reasoning, but, but they're, they're nuts. Yeah, uh, to put it mildly. Yeah. Um, so you, you so in this book, you continue an argument that you began in your previous book, which was called The Virtue of Nationalism. Um, what is national conservatism as you are you know, proposing that as a solution, you know, kind of a response to where we've gone off uh, off course? OK, well, the, the 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 expression national conservatism is kind of redundant because I mean I, I I what what I really would like to say is that there just is is something that's that you can call Anglo American the Anglo American conservative tradition and um, uh, one of the things that's absolutely central to this uh, to this tradition is is the existence of nations um, uh, the the idea that the world is divided to nations when I when I say nations I don't mean states I mean groups of people who are loyal to one another and have uh, a common language, a common religion, a common history. Um, I, I don't mean that they're internally homogenous, but but groups that that feel a loyalty to one another because because they share to some degree or another uh, s some some of this co common inheritance. And that that biblical idea of of, of what a nation is is uh, at at the basis of a thousand years of Anglo American conservative conservative thought, which is you know, very, very often explicitly linked to the Bible. And when it's not, then it's, it's based on English common law, which, which is itself in a lot of ways descended from the biblical tradition. And uh, so, so today, uh, when you say conservative, because so many people in the last generation have started using the term conservative to just mean universal liberalism. I mean, I'm talking about uh, libertarians who think that, you know, that society, it, you know, is, fundamentally just based only 
on the principle of freedom, or uh, uh, neoconservatives who who think that a freedom and equality just is the natural constitution, and that we should not only you know t uh, tell other people about it, but we should even be willing to invade other countries in order to impose a liberal constitution on them. So that the, in the last generation, there have been all these these. Uh, s strange um, uh, versions of, of liberalism and libertarianism that that have kind of taken over what used to be called the conservative movement, and uh, in, in under these circumstances, uh, my my colleagues and I decided that when we're defending the you know the actual Anglo American conservative tradition, that just for shorthand, it's it's easiest to call it national conservatism, so people can understand we're not talking about. Um, you know the 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 the, the kind of uh, neoliberalism or neoconservatism that brings you to think that that uh, America and Britain should be the world's policemen and and uh, and uh, wars in in the Balkans and in the Middle East and Africa are just you know part of the natural order of things that that you know we should go out wage wars in order to impose this kind this kind of liberal theory. So national conservatives are um, are 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 are. It, the, those those people who um, live in the political and cultural space in between libertarians to our left, uh, who are only concerned with with the liberty of the individual, and uh, and sort of the you know the the white identity groups, the racial the racial um, theories on the far right, uh, which, which which approach politics from the angle of uh of of race, race racial identity you know just like the woke do so in between there's this vast vast space where the the, the majority of uh of conservative leaning uh voters traditionalists re, re, religious voters nationalists it's a it's a very very large space uh in in america there's you know i don't know if it's 30 40 50 percent of the the population naturally gravitates to that place, but uh, but it, but it's very very underdeveloped in terms of uh, political theory and you know pub public ideology and and explanations in it at an intellectual level that people can understand. So uh, when when we started doing the you know the national conservatism conferences in uh, in 2018, basically our purpose was first to show that there is such a group that 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 there is such a group of nationalist conservatives who who you know they 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 they, they treasure individual liberty but the, but but they think that the the common project is about a is about a nation a real nation that needs to be advanced and defended and promoted and you need to think about its interests and what holds it together and what its inheritance is um and uh we've been doing that now for 4 or 5 years and uh, uh with I, I think rapidly increasing success, and ho hopefully at some point we'll we'll be able to just drop the word national and people know what conservative means again. Yeah, yeah. I, I, what what would you say to people who say that? Well, that that just sounds like Christian nationalism. Are you are you afraid of that term? Do you think that term has any particular meaning that we need to shy away from, or is it just another slur look, that I, the left I, I, throws? Look, I, I, I'm not afraid of it. I, I, I'm a little just because I'm Jewish. I'm a little bit hesitant to tell other people what labels they should be comfortable with. You know, like what labels that this movement should adopt. As far as uh, you know, there are a lot of Christians in, uh, involved. But as I wrote in my book, I mean, I, I just I, I think uh, the the up until World War II, the idea that America was a Christian nation. Uh, was was part of American constitutional law. The 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 Supreme Courts and 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 famous jurists re returned to it over and over again that America is a Christian nation, that Americans are a Christian people, and so I you know I I just find it very difficult to understand uh, you know what all the the squeamishness is about I, in the generation of of uh, FDR or Eisenhower. Um, they, they certainly, everybody certainly thought that Americans were a Christian nation, and and said so. And that that's what FDR, you know, what be before World War II when he describes uh, what it is that uh, uh, America is going to be fighting for. He he calls America God fearing democracy. He doesn't he doesn't know what liberal democracy is because the term was 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 not really known yet then. And so, so God fearing democracy, Christian democracy, Christian nationalism—I mean, all those things seem to me to be 
uh, completely unproblematic, but you know you can you can take a, a, any phrase and make it problematic. Sure. I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I I don't mean that just glibly. I mean, I think it's it's a fact that that cons- any word that conservatives use to describe themselves uh, is going to be a word that is has at this point been uh, tarred and feathered and tarnished and, and 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 attacked in the media and in the universities. So that includes the word conservative and includes the word word uh, nationalist and includes the word Christian and includes Bible. I mean, I don't know if you've ever noticed this that that you know, even knowledgeable, pious Christians and Jews, when they start, you know, moving around in educated circles, they be, they they stop talking about the Bible because it's embarrassing. Because could be because the 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 prestige of the the Bible has been smashed by two hundred years of, of of slander against it, and and it, it's it's the same thing. I mean, I think I think basically we should we should get used to the fact that that the the words that we naturally use to describe ourselves are all. All of them have been uh, slandered and tarnished, and and we should just deal with it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I think that that squeamish squeamishness you talk about, um, you had a great answer for that in the book where you you talked about the the fusionism, you know, that kind of arose um, between traditional conservatives and and uh, more kind of libertarian freedom, um, you know, liberals. Um, to fight the Cold War and how that resulted in a kind of public-private distinction. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, the 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 modern modern meaning, like the last seventy years or or, or sixty years of uh, of the way the word conservative u- is used. Uh, the, the the word conservative in American Britain is is not used the way that it was used before World War II. Um, and uh, what what happened was that uh, that during the Cold War, um, uh, anti-Marxist liberals and and traditionalist conservatives uh, formed a coalition in order to fight communism abroad and and socialism at home. And and I you know I, I don't want to uh, criticize. I mean this is this was uh, Bill Buckley's movement, and um, I I don't like to criticize it too too strongly because uh, it it did what it set out to do. I mean it it in fact. Defeated the Soviet Union and uh, uh, liberated, liberated uh, Eastern Europe from communism and and rolled back um, uh, socialism and communism in in American Britain and other countries for an entire generation. You know, so so there's a lot of good that um, that came of that, but I I do think that now it's a whole generation after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and we don't look like. You know, and I, the conservatives didn't win. We know that the conservatives didn't win. We know because because uh, because America has 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 continued to be an overwhelmingly liberal country. And in the year twenty twenty, all the liberal institutions, most of the major liberal institutions, uh, collapsed and gave way to this woke neo Marxism, and and the the takeover of uh, of Western universities, media. Uh, governments, uh, public institutions of every every kind by woke neo Marxism. What caused it is the is the the decay of the liberalism that 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 had run those institutions. If if liberalism had been able to defend itself against uh, against neo Marxism, then we'd be in a different place. But liberal liberalism has no capacity to defend itself. Uh, against this kind of uh, uh, aggressive movement that claims to be uh, reasoning and looking for equality and liberty, and uh, I, I mean, basically, it uses its own it uses liberals uh, rhetorical weapons against it, and liberal liberalism can a- collapses before it. So at this point, I think anti-Marxist liberals and conservatives, we we have to rethink, you know, the 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 whole her- the the whole story um, since World War II. And uh, you know, there are certain things that obviously I don't. You know, I don't think any of us would want to give up. I don't think anybody wants to give up on, you know, on on uh, the 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 noble aspiration to uh, to uh, eliminate persecution of blacks in the American South, for example, which which was one of the great motivating forces that led to this liberal hegemony. But but when you look at the um, 
at this deal, this fusionism between the anti-Marxist liberals and the conservatives, I think, as you said, the most the most striking aspect of it when you look at it today is that basically it privatizes anything, any kind of traditionalism, any kind of religion, any kind of uh, national inheritance is privatized. So, so that the liberalism is 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 asserted as kind of the public philosophy of Buckley's movement. And there was an awful lot of that in, you know, in, in Reagan and Thatcher. I mean, I, th I think personally, Reagan and Thatcher are very conservative people and they were nationalists and, and, and they believed in Christianity. But, uh, but the, 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 the construct, the construction that goes, we're going to be um, liberals in our public life, in our government, but we're going to be uh, conservatives in our private life. It turns out that, that that that's a complete failure. It's a it's a catastrophic failure. You can't you can't send kids to school five days a week, all day long, and put them in an environment in which God is never mentioned and Scripture is ne is is never ever mentioned, and 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 there's no school prayers, and you can't even have a moment of silence because you know because the the, the Bible and God are such dangerous ideas that you know if you were to mention them that they would do like all this damage to 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 the kids or to minority. You can't send kids to schools like that and expect that they're going to come out being Christians or Jews, because mm -hmm. the 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 absence of honor given to God, the absence of honor given to a national and religious tradition into scripture, the kids ingest that and they come to understand that it means that basically you don't need those things. And 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 that that's the root of the problem. That's the heart of all of it was that that wrong turn. And at this point, religious Christians and 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 Jews and others who were sympathetic um, if there's going to be any kind of uh, repentance and restoration, then the the first place to start is 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 making sure that God and Scripture are are in the schools that your children go to. Okay, <clears throat> so that raises a question. So there's a lot of um, there's a growing number of people on the left, liberals that are concerned about wokeness and the neo Marxists. How do we work with them to fight this stuff um, without falling into the same trap that led us to this public private distinction you're talking about well the the, the main the main trap i mean the the, it, the the trap like when you go back and read what was being being written in the 1960s uh, it, it it's it's very obvious that there there um, buckley and especially frank his, his partner frank meyer and those who worked with them they were very concerned that there had to be a single united movement that consisted of of anti-Marxist liberals and conservatives. And, I, I, you know, I, th I think it was um, strained and false uh, at every point. And I think that the the uh, that it was simply a I mean, it's just just a strategic mistake. I, I you know, I, I think. Conservatives need to need to develop, develop conservatism. We need to live with other conservatives, to meet with other conservatives, to to create conservative schools and conservative institutions, a conservative language, and none of that should prevent us from uh, alliance with anti-Marxist liberals on the many issues on which we agree. But saying that we're the same thing, you know, say, say, saying that uh, that. Uh, you know, many of the anti-Marxist liberals, the, the leading anti-Marxist liberals, have very different ideas uh, about about the family, about uh, the, uh, pornography, about uh, uh, the the um, uh, the the importance of uh, tradition, the place of tradition, uh, the place of God. There's these these things are. It, it's it's a gap that is not is not bridgeable in the sense of creating a single worldview, um, and uh, out of them. And I don't think we need a single worldview. I think we we need to be friends with anti-Marxist liberals everywhere where we have something in common with them. And today, that's a lot of things. But at the same time, conservatives need to uh, work hard uh, and make their top priority being strengthening of traditionalist institutions, institutions whose purpose is to constantly work on inculcating a life of conservation and transmission, a life of honor and a life of, of, uh, of, 
piety and uh, and and sacredness and Sabbath keeping and all the other things that come to us from Scripture. Uh, and if we can do that, uh, I think that we'll find today that uh, that conservatives can quickly and easily become much stronger than than neo Marxist liberals. And that that's part of what happened uh, in the 1960s as well. Is that the is is that uh, liberalism was on the rise. It was sort of the the, the tide and it, everything and everyone was being inundated by liberalism and and liberalism looked like the stronger party and conservatives were willing to 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 kind of be the junior partner in that. And I I think now look we we see what's happening. We understand that that America and the other Western democracies are are simply on the brink. They're on the edge of the volcano. That, I mean. There is nothing that is that is holding together anymore. It's it's flying on fumes, and if we can't at this time, as as God fearing religious people, um, assert a worldview that is based on our on our values, then we're lost. And and so we need to do that. And the fact that we have all of us, I, I think, have have uh, liberal anti-Marxist friends who we respect, and and uh, and in many cases we love, and 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 that's just fine. We don't have to agree with them on on a lot of things, but 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 I, I think the time for compromise is uh, uh, the the theory that compromising on these things right now is just going to lead us to catastrophe. Yeah. Um, so a lot of your criticisms of liberalism sound an awful lot like uh, a lot of what I'm reading on the kind of new dissident neo-reactionary right. Um, whereas I think your solution is to go back to our traditions. You know, there a lot of the people I'm reading on the right seem to think that, you know, the whole project was doomed from the start. You know, 1776, it was you know, the seeds of destructions were planted in 1776. What, what would be your answer to that, you know, people who are kind of leaning that way? Look, I, th th there's kind of a, um, an optical trick that's, that, that's going on here. Um, Enlightenment liberalism is a particular thing. And it's been criticized by all sorts of people for centuries. It's been criticized, you know, it's it, it's been criticized by by the founders of uh, uh, of the uh, the Islamist movement. I mean, the, the 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 Islamic fundamentalist intellectuals they criticized liberalism, and and uh, communists criticized liberalism, and fascists criticized liberalism. Liberalism. All sorts of people have made these criticisms, and and there's a certain similarity. Uh, between the criticisms, and the reason is because because uh, because liberalism has a bunch of flaws that uh, a lot of intel intelligent people can see, uh, regardless of what the alternative that they're proposing is, and you know the the fact that you know that uh, that uh, somebody that that a, a a nationalist conservative might agree with the Ayatollah Khomeini about you know some of the things that are wrong with liberalism doesn't mean that i support having uh uh you know I I I iranian shiite theocracy imposed on the united states or in any other country uh, so i i, I yes that the, um the, uh, the, there's uh, there's definitely similarity in the criticisms but there isn't very much similarity in the solutions because you know if 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 you actually look at the you know, at at, at uh, what's being proposed by, um, I don't know, by by Adrian Vermeule or by uh, Curtis Yarvin or by Bronze Age pervert or by, I mean, there's all of these sort of uh, uh, personality cults on the far reaches of the right, and I, I think all of them are all of them are born out of despair. They're 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 born out of a a feeling um, that you know we've that that the good guys have been losing whoever they are have been losing for 30 years or for 300 years and uh and and at this point that the right thing to do is to uh is to sit out the the attempt to save uh America and other democratic nations because the American constitution has failed a lot of them say christianity has failed judaism has failed the bible has failed not not all of the people i name but a lot of them that's what they're saying and and you know, if you're 
if if you're if you're 25 years old and you have no experience in life and you have no inherited tradition and you don't understand what those you know what your ancestors were fighting for so it it it, it makes sense you have no tradition so you go after some some wise guy who you know who publishes uh uh, uh books that are uh uh entertaining and offensive and entertainingly offensive in in you know in, in in criticizing everything that exists but that that's not that's not where christians and and jews are i mean young christians jews are are reading those things but i think just take a look at what's happened after dobbs um after the supreme court overturned roe v wade and to begin with a lot of us uh, you know have have uh, the, the older older ones among us on 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 the in the on the conservative side uh, we've we've actually uh, either directly been fighting or at least you know watching writing publishing participating as observers it doesn't matter we we've all seen um the tragedy unfolding over the last 50 years since Roe v Wade and and all of the people that we're talking about on the far right, the, 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 the people are saying it's hopeless and there's nothing you can do and, and you should give up on all the traditions and, and, you know, and just impose a dictatorship as soon as, as soon as you can. Where were those people the day after the Dobbs decision? You know, where were they? You know, I, I'll tell you where they were. They, 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 they were hunkered down and hiding because, because this, this despair that they've been teaching the young people in, in a day, it turned out that, you know, that, that you know all sorts of imperfect characters like Donald Trump and and Mitch McConnell and the Federalist Society you know all of these flawed people that you know that 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 the far right has been ridiculing and abusing that that they succeeded in in establishing you know a, a tr an immense restoration of American, American, Anglo-American constitutional soundness through hard work, through political action over an entire generation and more. And, you know, okay, it's not enough, but it, I, I think it's enough to prove to any, you know, to any sensible person that just giving up the fight because, you know, because, because one of these characters uh, can write an entertaining book uh, ridiculing you for fighting. I mean, this is absurd. It, it, look, we can do what we can do, and then God makes the decision about what happens. That's the way politics works. And Christians and Jews, if they if they study Scripture, then uh, I, I have a I wrote a book called God and Politics in Esther. If anybody's interested in in this, the the entire book is 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 on this this particular piece of of uh, biblical um, theology and political theory, which is that in 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 the political arena. You work with what you've got. And if what you've got is Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell, McConnell and the Federalist Society, I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to improve on it, but if that's what you've got, then you make alliances where you can, you roll the dice, and God willing, you've planned well enough, and and, and God's willing to help a little bit, and you can win. And and none of these people are that, that we're talking about, none of them are ever willing to actually uh, deal with that biblical reality that human beings have to uh, uh, maneuver within flawed, polluted, awful societies all through scripture. That's what's happening. And sometimes they're smart enough and they're strong enough and God helps them enough and they win. And th that's it. That's what our hope is based on, is, is the possibility of being able to improve this world. Okay, so I mean, if all you care about is some some future 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 life, and you don't believe in in the Christian afterlife or in or in any Jewish theory of the subject, so you say, okay, so the future the future utopia is is uh, is dictatorship in America, and you make up this this utopia that you think is going to be perfect, but it's not real. It's not reality. R reality is what we've got, and we got to fight. That's it. Yeah, that's yeah. I, we're as Christians and, and, and Jews, we have this you know, belief in God as sovereign. You know, some trust in horses, uh, some trust in chariots. We trust in the name of the Lord, our God. And I think that, yeah, as Christians, it, we don't need to give in to that despair that it's all hopeless because we know who is ultimately in charge and, and moving in the realm of men and, and policy. policy. Um, you know, John Adams famously said that our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people and wholly inadequate for a government of any other. 
that doesn't really describe the American people anymore. Um, how do, is there any hope of recovery without some sort of great religious awakening? No, I don't think so. Uh, but, but uh, you know, a, a great religious awakening is something that you can, um, you, you, you can only plan it in part. You know, the, 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 there's a certain amount of planning we can do. And, and I, I think our planning should be in the direction, first of all, of admitting that, um, that in the United States, the, the, the Everson decision in, in 1947, which, uh, in, in which the Supreme Court imposed for the first time uh, the doctrine of se separation of church and state on all 48 states, you know, by, by, by the national American government from the center. I think that that was a, a tragic mistake, not just for America, but basically for the entire democratic world. And um, th th that, that's, the, that, that's the focal point that we need to be looking at, is, is that uh, the, the, the American constitution was, was never designed to, uh, uproot, to uproot Christianity, the Bible, religion, God, uh, from those places, those societies that believed in it, and uh, there still are, even though you know the direction is definitely uh, not good, but there's still plenty of places in the United States, and I think especially now when you know people can see the the religion of woke neo Marxism that you know that, that that's about to take over, and and when people see that, I think that there are many places uh, in the United States and also in other countries where there there exist. Uh, Christian majorities or pro-Christian majorities, uh, where where you can build an alliance to uh, to reestablish a a public culture based on a biblical moral vision, and that that doesn't you know that doesn't have to happen in uh, in California and New York. It to, to, for starters, it, the the first thing that needs to happen is that there have to be states where there is such a majority and and experiments in how to restore these traditions and of course everybody you know is going to be you know yelling at you that that you know that that, that you're a theocrat and a fascist and you're going to you know, and and you're going to import the ayatollahs for advice like all that's going to happen but what we really need is examples living examples of societies in which the uh the the neo marxist public culture is replaced by a christian or biblical public culture and and so people can see it they can so they can see what's right with it and they can see what's wrong with it i i think that once that's done that people are going to stampede in the direction of of that kind of society both 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 believers and people who just want a better life yeah and so so we we, we've got to do that. We have to. We we have to create alternate models, and and the thing that's standing in the way right now is is uh, uh, is is not just the Supreme Court, but the the public belief that you know somehow America was 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 founded on the the, the concept of separation of church and state, which which simply has no basis in in constitutional reality. I mean, the, the, the United States, every one of the states either had an established church or at least es establishments of Christianity or, or of re religion at the time of the American Constitution. So so that needs to be restored. So there's a lot of books written about political philosophy that may have some lofty ideas and like, OK, yeah, that that's cool. I hope somebody in power reads that and <laughs> makes those changes. Um, <laughs> Your book, though, is very practical. The, the last chapter of your book is on living a conservative life. You give us, the regular people, something to do, how to plug into this project. Can you, you know, real quick, I know we're running out of time. What is, what does it mean to live a conservative life? Well, it, it doesn't mean to li lead a liberal life. I mean, a, a, a liberal individual is somebody who I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about what ideas you have in your head or what things you say. I'm talking about how you actually live. And uh, there is such a thing as a liberal life. A liberal life is a, is, is, is a person who says, um, I, 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 I'm a law unto myself, obligations, you know, I, I decide what obligations I have. And if I took on an obligation and now I don't think it's an obligation anymore, then, you know, so, so I don't have an obligation. And that, that, that's the kind of life where, um, you know, you, 
you, you don't need to get married. You can put it off. You don't have any obligation to have children to, you know, to take care of your parents, all those things. They're not, they're only obligations if you think they're obligations. And in that kind, that kind of life, so you so so you put off anything that looks difficult. Marriage looks difficult. Staying married looks difficult. If it starts getting difficult, then you can always get divorced, and, and everybody does. And and uh, that 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 kind of a life is it 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 it's an it's an immature life. It's it it it. Those of us who've raised children know that that there's sort of like a a natural inclination of some teenagers to just be like that you know like this when you raise children some of them reach adolescence and they and they're loyalists and they want to be just like their parents and they do their best to to live up to what their parents want them to be or they what they think they want them to be and some kids are the opposite they they're just you know they they just feel suffocated by you know by the fact that their parents exist somewhere and are thinking about them and 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 what we've done is we've turned that adolescent uh, period of um, uh, hormonal, uh, hor hormonally induced rebellion and recklessness, uh, where you say, you know, I can make all the decisions. I don't need to be told. We've turned that into like like a political theory. Uh, and then declared it to be absolute universal <laughs> truth, and we're trying to live according to that political theory. That it, it, I mean, it's just an adolescent worldview. It does it. It doesn't describe what human beings are really like, what they really need, or the obligations that they really have. So, uh, to be to to lead a conservative life to begin with uh, is to lead a life in which you know whether you were a rebel or a loyalist as a teenager. When when you reach your twenties, you start thinking seriously about what it is, how you can plug into uh, the the the, cons the 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 constructive life, the, the the preservation and strengthening of what's good in the society that you've inherited, and doing that in a traditional society, it means you know to <laughs> to use an expression um, that you know my 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 my. My teenage son, when he finally gave up on on rebellion, one of my sons said to me, "Abba, Abba's father in in Hebrew said, Abba, I I want to take my place in the dominance hierarchy." <laughs> and I said, "What? <laughs> what are you talking about?" And he said, "Oh, that's Jordan Peterson." And and Peterson is very good at describing this that that to to be a healthy human being who is not constantly um, anxious and depressed and and sunk in in a in a feeling of directionlessness and not knowing where to go and not knowing how to make choices and not knowing who to believe to to get to save yourself from that life means first of all you need to find a a community a congregation uh, where the hierarchy still exists and a life of conservation and trans and transmission is taking place and you need to to go there not as an equal because you're not equal you need to go there as someone who's come to learn and say you know I've come to learn I want to learn how to live from you and if you can do that you you join the congregation you start learning from them you don't sit around saying oh you know I don't believe this and I don't believe that forget it you you actually humble yourself and say, you know, maybe my life just hasn't been so perfect until now. And what I want is I want to learn what these people understand. And you plug into that. Now, different congregations and different religious traditions, they have, you know, they're, they're different. They have different views on these things. But what they have in common is that, that they all have a view to God. They all have a view to eternity. They all have a view to right and wrong. They all have, have, have scripture and a way of learning scripture. And, and, and they all have a tradition of how family life is supposed to work. And in, in the good places, it's not the nuclear family. It's still the old traditional family, which, it, which, is, a, which is an integral part of, the, uh, uh, of the, the, the surrounding congregation, the surrounding community. And um, when you step into that world, which, which is what my, I, I, I describe my wife and I doing this when, when we were in college, is when you, you make the conscious decision that you're going to uh, set aside your arrogance and begin learning again. So, you know, you, you, you may later decide that there's a, you know, there's a better church or a better synagogue or a better community, but, but the moment you start doing this, 
you open yourself up to being a part of the great inheritance and it starts it starts to to flow into you and some of it you you like more and some of it you like less some of it you learn to understand you know with with the years and some of it you never you you never agree with it and then you 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 shift to a different you know a slightly different community and and you feel much happier but this is the only way that human beings can be healthy is by being part of the chain of transmission in a healthy community that's handing down the the, the inheritance and, and 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 fixing it each generation just a little bit to improve it that's it that's what you got to do and and it and and it works i'm not saying it's it's not perfect it doesn't save you from you know from all the challenges of li- living life life is difficult you know no matter what you do but it's so much better than what you're doing now I mean, it's just a liberation. It is. It's a salvation. Well, that, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I think you're a, a, a very important voice um, on the right uh, these days. And um, I'm excited to be able to share this with our audience. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, where can they find me? The, my, my books are on on Amazon and every place that... Uh, uh, that, that, you know, where, where people are selling books without censoring them (laughs) and, uh, and, uh, the national conservative conservatism movement, we have, uh, a couple of annual, uh, conventions where I think people can, can come and get their batteries charged this, uh, this year, September 11th through 13th in Miami, uh, is NatCon three, the, the third one we've done in the United States. Everybody should just come. I mean, it, it, it's a great place to talk about these things. And, uh, and me, uh, you, you can, you can, uh, look me up at Um, uh, there's an email address there. You can write to me. Happy to hear from you. Well, excellent. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I see you announcing people, um, you know, speakers at the, the conference. And I'm like, man, this is, this is becoming a must, uh, a must participate, uh, conference you've got a great lineup so i'm I'm excited to to see what comes out of that but uh thank you so much thank for your you. time i appreciate sure. it god, god god bless you take yeah, care you too bye that's our show for today thanks so much to dr hazoni for sitting down to talk with me uh if you want to get his book there are links in the show notes uh definitely one of the top read um top books i've read this year so check that out uh, a lot of um meaty ideas to to wrestle on um If you are interested in attending the National Conservatism Conference that's coming up in September, you can also find a link to that in the show notes as well. Uh, Thanks so much for listening. Uh, Please share these shows with your friends if you find them helpful. Uh, You can give me a follow over at Twitter at uh, at Josh Dawes. And um, please send me your feedback. Let me know uh, what you think of the show. If you have any guests that you'd like me to try and bring on or any topics you'd like for me to cover. I'm always up for suggestions. Uh, My DMs are open over there at Twitter, so feel free to to send me a note. Um, If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and hit like and subscribe uh, so you don't miss content that's coming up. And if you're listening on uh, podcasts, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts as that does help uh, expand the reach of the show. So thanks so much. Until next time, we will see you soon.